Um, welcome to one of our expert interviews um, where we talk to people, a scholar, a storyteller, and this time a youth, um, all about um, how to develop good humans, to create good humans, both in the storytelling world and in the real world. Um, and um, we're talking about character strengths and virtues and how they show up in storytelling. We're very, very grateful to the John um, Templeton Foundation for funding this work. So um, I'm gonna have each of the um, our panelists introduce themselves and tell me about one piece of media that you love, that you think um, exemplifies character strengths. And let's start with Gael. Hi, everyone. I'm Gaio Ator. I'm the founder and former host of Teenager Therapy, which is the largest youth mental health podcast in the world. And more recently, I'm the founder of Astro Studios, which is a Gen Z podcast network. And to me personally, I think one of the top shows that really embodies uh, positive character traits is sex education. I think they have an incredible diversity of characters and different perspectives and values that they just all represent what Gen Z is about in a really great way. Let's go with Meg LaFove. Uh, I'm Meg LaFove. I'm a screenwriter um, and producer, and I co-wrote Inside Out and wrote The Good Dinosaur, another Pixar movie, and was uh, created the story with Nicole Parman for Captain Marvel, among other things. Um, and I was thinking about this question from the very, what was the first thing to the first character I can think about? as impacting my life and being an example of this. And I would say for me as a female, it was Princess Leia. Oh. Um, she had a goal of her own and she didn't really care what the men were doing and whether they were coming or not, she was doing it. And um, I thought that she embodies a lot of wonderful uh, virtues, uh, character virtues uh, that we're going to talk about today. And that's, yeah, she's evergreen, right? That held up. And Dr. Meg Rani. Uh, thank you so much. It's a joy to be here today. So my name is Megan Rani. I am an emergency physician. Uh, I do research on violence prevention, particularly among youth, but also around mental well-being because they're so tightly tied together. I'm also the dean of the School of Public Health at Yale University. And I'll answer in a way that kind of bridges in between um, the two of you. I, I thought about this in both ways. I'll say for myself personally, um, one of my earliest positive character strength role models was Anne of Green Gables, who I think exemplified resilience, positivity, creativity, and the uh, drive to, and conviction that you can make the world a better place. On the opposite end of the spectrum, um, looking at my children who are teenagers, um, I'll say that the Barbie movie this summer really hit it home um, for the current Gen Z, at least, at least in my household. Um, in terms of thinking about how you take a situation, figure out when something's going wrong, and then create a, a more positive outcome and also inspire those around you to do better as well. I love it. Barbie is of the moment. And do you think, Meg, you've been in the business a long time, I have too, or was, and Barbie is just does exemplify so many important things, I think, to Gen Z in particular. But do you think that Hollywood will, will this be a one-off? Like, oh, it did it because it was Barbie and, and you know, and or would you think we'll have more female directors, have more women, have more um, people making movies that are out of the box like that? Um, I know I've heard both things. The, the pessimists of the industry say, they're just gonna say we need more toy movies and not get it at all. Um, and then the optimists say, no, it's a real breakthrough and Greta is showing the way. And, um, you know, when you've been in the business long, this long, you've seen this happen before and everybody say, this is it, this is the time. And then it is, but it isn't, you know, <laughs> I don't things yeah. change. I don't think things change. I don't think people change or, or, or society changes in big bursts like this. I think they, there is a, it's a slow shift. And I do think it's a major important part of the shift. Yeah. And I, I would agree. Go ahead, Meg. I was going to say, I think it was Ruth Handler in the movie who said something, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but something to the effect of people live for a short period of time, but ideas live forever um, when talking about her creation of Barbie. And I do think, I, again, I'm not in the business, but from the outside, it, it does feel like the movie has at least shifted the conversation 
um, amongst the teens that I know, although Gail can correct yeah, me. Gail, what do you think? <laughs> Why do you think it hit with Gen Z? And if you can connect it to character strengths, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, I think one particular uh, reason I think it, it hit really well is how direct it was. It, it really laid it out for you in a clear way that was easy for audiences all across the spectrum to understand. And for some people, I think it came across as obvious, but then again, that's also perhaps just because there's a lot of Gen Z that spend a lot of time in very progressive social circles on social media and allows them to see these messages over and over again that when they see it on screen, it's very much obvious. But to the other hand, on the other hand, the side of teenagers and young people that haven't been exposed to messages like that, seeing it in such a creative way, but also in a very direct way, I think was really eye-opening and is the reason why it was able to shift so many different perspectives around these values. And it's actually one of the things that I, that I think is really incredible um, among Gen Z is that there's a lot of value in, in directly really putting out the values as opposed to hiding it throughout more complex storylines. Yeah, I think so too. Um, so Dr. Rani, Rani um, so we found from our own research and from other research, we know that many, many Gen Zers, um, this is one of the reasons Gael's podcast was so successful. They regularly experience mental health challenges. I'm a parent as well. My kids, you know, digital adolescents, they experience them. Do you think that promoting positive character virtues in both the real world and storytelling could support adolescent mental health? So obviously, as a researcher, I will say that we need research to prove that. Um, but there's no reason to think that it wouldn't be beneficial. And I'm going to say kind of a little more about why, why I think that's so. So as anyone who is a parent or a teen today has observed, kids for the past decade have been experiencing increasing rates of anxiety, depression, and other forms of mental illness. This predated COVID, although, of course, the COVID pandemic exacerbated it. And in parallel, we're unfortunately facing a shortage of mental health specialists, psychiatrists, social workers, psychologists, and so on, particularly mental health specialists who come from culturally or linguistically congruent backgrounds. So if you self-identify as Black or Hispanic or Asian, um, if you are an immigrant to this country, you are going to have more trouble finding a therapist who matches kind of your own cultural outlook. So we're seeing kids with higher rates of um, mental illness, parents that don't know what to do with it, um, and then and then a shortage of therapists, particularly those who who kind of match um, from a, from a cultural perspective. One of the things that many of us have identified in the research is that one of the factors that we think has led to this rise in anxiety and um, depression and, and loneliness um, is related to a, a lack of great role models and a lack of skill sets on how to resolve many of the common conflicts and challenges of adolescence. There is no one who goes through the years from fifth to eighth grade. You know, if you go back to my grandparents and my great grandparents, who will say that that is an easy period of time, but kids are now often doing it outside of kind of that uh, community of adults who show them positive character traits and help work through um, those very, very common um, causes of, of problems. Add on to it, of course, that our, our world is a little bit more complex now than it has been. We're facing climate change. Um, we're increasingly aware of the systemic effects of racism. We're dealing with gun violence. And so kids are not just experiencing normal adolescence, but also potentially a sense of hopelessness in the face of the world. All of that added on, when you think about how do we fix it, we can't get enough therapists. We can, however, help work with kids to help provide exemplars of how you can be resilient how you can work through both the normal challenges of adolescence, but also these seemingly world-changing um, epidemics and, and catastrophes that we're facing. Um, you know, we're recording this today, of course, uh, just a few days after um, the, the war in Israel has started. And I know I've had conversations with my teens, having them see pictures of kids that have made it through crises like these before um, and understand how to uh, use those positive traits in order to process these moments and hopefully give agency and help create change that can have a positive impact on youth. Now, will storytelling alone be adequate? I think, Yalda, that's why your center is here. Is, and that's why many of us are, are doing this research. Um, but there's no reason to think that it would not be effective. And heck, 
As I frequently say, we're never gonna fix any of these problems with a single solution. We need all of them to the table um, and, and portraying positive character values is absolutely something that will not hurt and can only help. So Meg, thank you. That was um, very beautifully put and quite quite true that there are no longer communities and um, no longer these sort of you know places. First of all, ki kids can't go out and gather and run around the streets anymore. Churches and clubs and all these and extended families, they're just not there. Um, in this world of media 24 seven, Meg, I'm going to go to you for sort of legacy media, you know, storytelling, traditional storytelling, and Gael for you for social media. How can, can it be an antidote? Um, how can we extend the power of the storytelling? How can we, storytellers work with sort of newer modern forms of storytelling as well to, to fill the gap? Do you believe that's possible, Meg? Do I believe it's possible to work with new forms of storytelling or storytelling at all? Storytelling at all in your place. Do you think it's possible for storytelling and the kind of storytelling that you do for television, movies? I don't know if you've actually done TV, but um, for that kind of storytelling to, to support young people um, in their development of uh, character strengths and building resilience and, you know, curiosity, learning, you know, humility, all these sorts of things. I mean, certainly, I mean, uh, people will have different opinions. My opinion is where your stories come from. That's why we have storytelling in our culture and as human beings, because um, we want to reflect that people can go through challenges and not just survive them, but transform through them and, and become even more powerful, even more of who they are. Um, I think that our human brain needs that and wants that. Um, and I think that's what I approach storytelling is the whole, the whole, the whole reason to do it is for that. And I understand that I'm in a business where the reason is to make money, but I don't see any reason they can't do both. Um, I think there's huge examples of making lots of money and yet doing it. If, I think if you even look at the Star Wars series or, or the Mar a lot of the Marvel movies, they're really taking those superheroes, even these great superheroes through their paces and really pushing them and showing them into conflict with each other in terms of social conflict, in terms of conflict with the self, in terms of conflict with things outside. Why do we do that? Well, I think we do it because that is how a person's consciousness about who they are and why they're here and what their purpose is and their transformation comes through those kinds of challenges seen in the storytelling. Um, so for me, storytelling is really about the human condition. So it really is about helping, you know, you can you can specifically go towards a, 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 a main character who is a teen, of course, um, but often we know that teens, uh, kids view up, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to hit a teen, you got to talk about a 20, 30 year old. And if you want to talk to a, a middle schooler, you got to talk about it like they do watch up. So I think ideally you're just talking about a person, um, a, again, the human condition. And, um, you know, for me, I, I because the story needs conflict, I, I want to talk about and I want to show virtue, but that doesn't mean every character starts there. It doesn't mean that isn't what they're learning about and learning how to handle that and, and how to, to in the good dinosaur, his dad is telling him, sometimes you got to go through the fear to get to the beauty on the other side. But he mm -hmm. doesn't understand that until he goes through his journey, you know, and inside out, Joy does not understand that she's causing a lot of her own problems because of her blinders. So and there's a movie as an example of that really did hit the culture and really is having a huge ripple effect um, from Pete Doctor's Genius. You know, I've had many, many people walk up to me from children, uh, uh, parents, parent, people who deal with children who are special needs to people who work or who are therapists who really say that that movie has helped them talk to kids and have a language to talk to them about who's driving um, and the and the choices that you have and that no emotion is bad, right? So to mm -hmm. me, that's all about figuring out who you are and what your rudder is and that your so much of storytelling is about it's not about what's happening out there. It's about what's happening in here. And can you find your own sense of self and value? And that comes from acceptance. We can talk as storyteller about these virtues, but ultimately for me, it's about acceptance of self so much. You're not going to get to some of those other things like gratitude if you can't accept failure. 
if you can't accept that failure isn't condemnation, it's education. It's your finding out stuff about yourself. Those are that's very, very hard for anybody, especially an adolescent, to come to grips with, right? So to me, um, that is what is the beauty of storytelling is helping people understand that they're not alone. Uh, every lots of people, if not every people, go through this experience of sometimes feeling lost, sometimes, uh, but that that's that's part of being a human being, and it is what brings us together, and it is part of life, and that it's okay. So to me, the base of all of these virtues is acceptance of the right now and where you are and what do you need and what do you want? Those kinds of questions is where I build stories from. So I think stories can do it. I think they do need, you know, it sometimes needs to be a, a conscious thing for the storyteller to be doing, but the best stories uh, have these thematics and th these emotional transformations or, or claiming of the power, which is often what an adolescent is doing. Yeah, that's, um, it's funny. I was talking to a storyteller at one point. We were talking about character strengths. This is an area I've been looking at and thinking about what media can truly teach for a long time. And one of them was resilience. And and this person said, every single movie and story is about resilience. That's it's just it. well, exactly. everything, right? You know, exactly. you overcome. I mean, it's from Homer, you know, or the Odyssey, right? You know, I mean, it, it, all the way back. Um, Gael, so... There's a lot of talk about young people your age. They don't care about movies. They don't care about TV. They don't watch these things. They only care about social media. First of all, do you think that's true? So I'll, I'll ask that first. I don't think it's true. I think young people definitely still care about media and, and role models in TV and film. I mean, personally, you see it. Um, really seasonally throughout, I mean, the resurgence in, in, in whether it be cartoons or anime or real life scripted or even unscripted at times, there's definitely a need. And, and I mean, I mean, the popularity of Barbie should on its own really show that it's really the opposite. And how do you think social media can maybe complement that kind of traditional story telling, you know, what we're thinking about at the center is you've got the story, the story is amazing, but Sometimes you can build resources around this story to help the young person really crystallize the messaging. Or if the story can't be as explicit about the messaging, you know, I'm learning gratitude now. You know, perhaps there's something off screen that could sort of talk about that character mini journey or whatever. Are there ways, and you, I know you and I have talked about that a lot, and we talked about it at our summit last year. Um, are there ways that you can see the work that you do? Um, not only with podcasts, but I know you know a lot about all sorts of social media could sort of supplement and support storytelling, traditional storytelling in supporting adolescents and bringing out these messages. Yeah, I think that there's definitely a lot of room for supplementary material to be developed alongside TV and film, particularly in how you bring the discussion, not just through online circles and social media, but actually start to transition it into in real life spaces and, and, and one serve as a catalyst not just for um, different values that you get to learn about but also community that you get to gather around based on the values of a tv show that really resonated with you just the way that you've seen netflix really lean into this approach of in real life pop-ups you see netflix restaurants based on the foods of these media uh, entities how do we create a show um, that is based around youth mental health but then partner with organizations such as netflix and different streamers to actually move that experience into the real world and hold conversations, um, kind of like a book club, right? But why don't we have media clubs for every show where we choose either, whether it be a cast member who can support the efforts, whether it be a producer, a director, or even influencers um, that are known to do content like this, can we tap into resources like that and partner with these in real life and big institutions to create these spaces where you can gather and take that conversation. Because if there's an episode that really impacted you, what was the value that we really focused on in that? And how do we talk with our community? And what you get, what you could get, is you could start to get these series that not only are you releasing weekly episodes and having discussions online, but if you're really passionate about it and if it really spoke to you, you can start bringing it into the real world. You can go gather, you could go find people like you, people that resonated with these issues. I mean, I think about how powerful that would be if the recent episode of a series really delved on a lonely queer character and you start holding these discussions nationwide about what it means to be queer and what it means to face loneliness 
I think that could do incredible just for the supplemental that. that it would offer. Yeah. But also start fixing some of these fundamental issues of why does it seem that we turn to media when we feel alone, but how can it serve as also the medium that allows us to connect with one another? Boy, I love that. And um, can I yeah, you can in there with, Yeah, Gal, if I can jump in, there's so there's actually tons of evidence showing that social media, when used well, not necessarily around the positive character strengths, but does exactly, I mean, it's exactly what you're saying, where it can actually mitigate loneliness, it can improve mental health, where it's around joining people together who are like, where it's creating hope. And there's also lots of evidence that both regular media and social media can share public health messaging. For example, episodes of ER can change the way that people think about CPR or about HPV vaccination. So I love that um, yeah. as an idea for how to accelerate kind of the things that we already know that media is able to do and then to use it as a way. I mean, I, I love your analogy of a book club um, to, to think about kind of how to go deeper into some of these and then almost create movements that then create gratitude and humility and integrity and hope on a larger scale for a larger group of people. Imagine if the For You page on TikTok was, you know, hashtag integrity. I, I'm making that up. I'm too old to actually come up with something good for him. <laughs> That's awesome. What a great idea. I know. And then I'm like, if you partner with Jed or somebody like that, they might have a real space somewhere. And like, you know, there's Heartstopper comes up, you know, we know the episode, we we create some sort of, you know, and you have an ex experts who know how to, because I think part of it is, you know, scholars and storytellers, you're bringing groups together to, um, so that you have evidence-based um, ways to really support youth. Um, Meg, I want to, I'm going to segue, I'm going to go look for funding for that with you, Gail. Um, <laughs> Meg, we, um, you and I had a little bit of an offline conversation about humility and how, how humility is, is often talked about as this perfect virtue that everyone should have. And we have in our tip sheets really looked at intersectionality. Um, one, one thing on curiosity, for example, um, curiosity, great virtue, right? But a black young male um, curious in, their, in a neighborhood that is not their own does not have the same ability to be curious as someone who doesn't have that skin color. So humility is the same thing. And I think gender really comes into it. What, how do you, what do you think about humility? How would you like it to show up in storytelling? How might it differ for different, um, for women and men? Yeah, I honestly take it or leave it. I think that's a word that white men have used for centuries to dominate and control. So to me, it's not a great word. I don't, I, 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 it's not a word I'd pick. Um, it's not a word I'd have in my head thinking about what I want to do for a character. I think that often white male characters need to learn humility. And there's plenty examples of that, of movies like that. Liar, liar. <laughs> many, many examples of you are an arrogant, self-centered may, white male. You need to learn humility. You need to learn you're not the only person on the planet. You need, like, there's plenty of those movies. Um, it, it feels very traditional to me. Whereas I, I personally think, and I'll only speak for women. I think women characters need to learn the exact opposite, which is um, you're allowed to have a want and it doesn't have to be about a guy. You're allowed to have agency and create your own world and your and your own life. And you actually have a responsibility to that and to have a purpose. Um, I, I think that female stories often go the exact opposite. And yeah. sometimes if they're not, it's because there's a white male writing it. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm being honest. No, and I actually think it, it reflects in the real world, right? It's a problematic I mean, word for me. I think that, um, and that could be because of my own upbringing. I think that often humility, when they said humility, they actually meant shame. Mm. And, I, and I think shaming is truly the darkest, easiest way to control people is if you speak up, if you go for what you want, um, you will be shamed back into your place. And, you know, shame is, you know, in working with Dacker and people on Inside Out, you know, and, you know, learning about emotions, uh, shame is a pretty toxic emotion. Um, it's different than guilt. Guilt is a completely different uh, experience. Guilt is about I did something bad and shame is I, I am bad. So if we're talking about humility and confidence and it's about, um, you know, staying humble is actually more about being rooted to something and to be, you know, have your feet on the ground so that you're present versus trying to get away from something through your ego or your extremes. 
that we're really talking about being secure enough in yourself to stay present, even in the face of challenges, um, even in the face of, of people confronting you, that you can stay present in that moment in order to find purpose, agency, want, drive, uh, and your own life then maybe, but to me, it's a loaded word. Um, so it's, I'm very interested to hear how you guys are going to, uh, uh, use that word as a, as a virtue. But, um, I, I, for me, I think I'll just, again, speaking only for female characters, I think often they need the opposite. They need yeah. to know they have the right to not be humble all the time and not yeah. service all the time. Yeah. I, I mean, that's essentially what we, we, the, I think ultimately, I think what we think for each of these is you can't assume one size fits all. And all of these virtues have been defined by cis white males and through through history. And they've been taken as something all of us should embrace. And when you really look at um, how they impact different identities and different genders and different you know ways that we show up in the world, they aren't universal. I mean, even gratitude. I mean, I believe in gratitude. I do believe it's a way to open your heart and be present. Um, but it also is a word that has been used for women for centuries to, well, aren't you grateful for what you have? Be glad for what you have. Why are you speaking? Why are you asking for more? Like it's a, it, they're tricky words um, versus um, being um, again, present and in your life and appreciative for what you have so that you can, you can be present and to move on to keep to keep building, to know yourself. Yeah. Which ultimately I think is the greatest virtue is knowing yourself. That's the most, the greatest thing you can do is to know and love yourself and have acceptance for that. Well, one word that you've used, and I'd love everyone else to comment um, and and um, we'll probably just go on for a few more minutes. You've used a f uh, quite a few times, and this is certainly considered a, a character strength is purpose. Um, and purpose is something, in fact, that's what I'm going to ask them to talk about, um, you know, purpose, belonging, meaning, meaning making, um, and media, I think can storytelling can support finding purpose. I think it's not something you can do when you're younger necessarily. It's something that you start thinking about as you're older. Um, how do you, can you just elaborate a little bit on purpose? And I'd love to hear from Megan and Gail as well and how you connect it, Meg, to storytelling? Uh, purpose is creates, uh, is goes back to want, and want create drives, it creates the drive for the character. And a lot of female writers have a really hard time with this because they don't even know what a want feels like in their body because they've been so enculturated out of it. So to have a want and drive towards it, um, and I think in terms of, again, people watching stories, to realize that, yes, you're going to hit failure, you're going to hit but you're also going to see incredibly beautiful things about yourself in the world when you start having a purpose and driving towards it, um, that it's not a, just a black or white situation, that it is a gray transformative situation. It's really about consciousness raising. Again, to me, the most important thing is knowing yourself and accepting yourself wherever you are right now, that that is such a, it can be such a heroic act, even in and of itself. To oh, yeah, self-compassion. <laughs> okay, Dr. Rani, Rani? Yeah. I think of purpose, I, I love that definition, Meg, and I so appreciate you calling all, all of that out around gratitude. And I will say as someone who just recently stepped into a new leadership position, those tropes follow you, you know, throughout your life. And so I really appreciate you calling those out. To me, I think about purpose a little differently, which is more in terms of meaning. So we have tons of data showing that if you think that there is a bigger purpose than you in some way, you have a if you see, you know, your life, not just in terms of your day to day kind of issues and fires and all the things that we're always dealing with. But if you see that there is a bigger meaning that you are working towards, that helps to create resilience in the face of, again, those inevitable um, struggles and challenges and disappointments. And so I think about purpose in terms of what is it? What is that long term view that you are going towards? We have studies showing that kids um, who don't think that they are going to live past 35 tend to um, have uh, more unsafe sex, be more involved with violence, not graduate from high school, et cetera. On the other hand, if you can give kids that sense of purpose, that um, anticipation, I wanna be a doctor, a lawyer, a um, an activist. I want to change um, my community's approach to climate change or to the way that we um, educate neuro, you know, neuroatypical youth, come up with whatever the thing is that resonates for you. 
that then helps to drive um, the ability to look past, again, those uh, occasional challenges and creates a sense of community around you of other people with a shared purpose. So I think of it in a, I think in a slightly kind of uh, orthogonal way to the way that Meg described it in terms of that long-term life view and all of the positive impacts of having purpose on one's mental well-being. It's almost like an intervention. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I mean, there's a whole science behind hope, which yeah. is a whole different conversation. Yeah. But to me, purpose is part of hope that you see. That because you if you, yeah, yeah, if you have purpose, it you it intrinsically means you believe you can have impact. Exactly. And agency, right? And, um, and agency, which is so which is huge. huge. So, yeah. yeah. And and I, what are you thinking about all these words that we're throwing at you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know that. Can you have purpose? Do you have agency? I know for my own children that it is a really hard time to be Gen it Z. Is. It is. Climate. Um, How are you feeling? It's very interesting because I have asked, I've, I have the, the privilege of being able to have a direct connection with our audience. And so throughout our episodes, I enjoyed making it a point to ask a poll um, throughout each episode. And at one point, I asked around 1.5 thousand teenagers how they feel about life. 16% said they feel hopeful and excited. 37% feel bad and just wanted to stop. And 48%, 48% have no thoughts. They just do. That was the result. And so the question to me is, what does it mean to have no thoughts and just do? That's a very Gen Z phrase of no thoughts going on in my head. I'm going through the motions. And to me, that signifies a lack of purpose. And I think it's interesting because a lot of us see purpose as this daunting thing that we have to be... Um, to give ourselves to our community, to give more of us to the world than we keep to ourselves. And I think purpose can also stem from very seemingly simple goals. I think Gen Z has a, a very ambitious nature and it's only amplified by social media, but there's a lot of value and there could be a lot of meaning in simple goals, whether it's just to raise a family, to have a stable job, to have these basic needs met, that's also something that to many people gives them meaning in their life. And I think it, it, it's, it's very spot on what, what, what you all said about purpose and, and giving meaning to even suffering and reframing a lot of um, intrinsic suffering as a source of meaning and purpose. And it's not to say to suffer intentionally, but if there are things about your life and your upbringing that you cannot change, it really starts to become meaningful when you give it a why of why it was necessary for you to go through that or why it's important for you to overcome that because if you have a really strong why it gives you that sense of purpose and hope um which i also well, i also think is flexible um i think it should be ever flexing and when you're young you might have a very seemingly superficial goal but it's it's the building of these goals that allows you to reach higher and higher to have a higher sense of purpose and meaning in your life I also believe, like the wonderful film Moana, sometimes that sense of purpose is just a feeling. It's just a sense inside your body. You may not be able to articulate it into an I want song, right? Um, and in your I want song might be full of half of the doubts, which her I want song written by Lin-Manuel Miranda is mostly why she can't do what she wants to do and how confused she is because she is feeling this sense of purpose to go. But she here, here's all the reasons I can't. But I really feel like I should. So it doesn't always have to be, especially at that young age, a conscious word sentence you can put on the wall. It can just be a feeling. It's often how a story comes to you because it is it's the dreamer. It's the deeper unconscious person in you that is dreaming forward in life. And if you can even just tap into that and let it be, it doesn't have to do anything. It doesn't have to save the world. It doesn't have to save anybody else. It just has to be. It will start to germinate, I believe, and start to show you things. And it can start very, very small wants, very small purpose, like you said. And then it it does start to grow as you as you get into that river. So I, I don't think always, especially young age, is something that they can people can articulate. I know my teenagers couldn't articulate it, but he just knew, he didn't know why, he just wanted to go hang out with the theater kids. He doesn't have any idea why, or, and is, he should be playing baseball. I should be doing this, but you know what? I feel present in, in myself when I'm with these theater kids. Okay, that's enough. Right now, the purpose is go hang out with the theater kids because you have. I have faith that it'll keep uh, talking to you and articulating to you as you grow, as long as you just stay with it. I, you know, and I also think, you know, just to bring it back to storytelling, Gail, is the why, why storytelling can, you can see a character go through, just like in Moana, go through sort of this, 
this journey of like, there's something there, there's some perhaps thing that I don't know about, there's something that happened to me, I'm trying to figure out why, and that can lead to modeling a sense of purpose through the character. Um, so I think that it is sort of intrinsically tied to storytelling. Um, we well, only have- you're, 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 Go ahead, Meg. I just <laughs> I love it. creating a story. I, I, the, I always am like, why? Why does she feel that? Why, why, why? That's such a powerful question to ask. It's, and then I'm going to kind of add on that that why and kind of watching a character struggle through that and then come out on the other side with having found a sense of purpose, having got, it is so powerful, but also so often missing from the media. And Gal, I'll look at you here, but the media that our youth are so often consuming right now, right? So you're watching your little 15 or 30 second reels on Instagram or Snap, you know, you're on, on Snapchat or on TikTok, um, or even I, I'm thinking about kind of long, you watch Euphoria, which is certainly a, a dramatically well done um, series, but is not a series that is full of hope and resilience. Um, and so being able to portray those character strengths in the face of, you know, you, I, I'm going to take myself back to my Gen X roots and think about kind of films like Train Spotting or Kids that we grew up in, which were that same kind of dark nihilistic view of the world, compare it to other films which showed us ways to kind of make our way through. There is a need for that and an absence of it that again, is not just in long form, but increasingly now in short form as well, where kids are not seeing um, examples of that type of resilience because it takes a while to get there. Well, um, I would actually argue a little bit because, please. you know, euphoria for first of all, is, you know, on HBO, an expensive platform. So very few people are, you know, I think it has an outsize us saying, oh my God, it's influencing, influencing every kid. Outer Banks. I'll say Outer Banks instead, okay. you know, like, she's, yeah. yeah. But you do see, see, you know, you do see resilience, even in Euphoria with Rue, she got, she got through yeah. a lot of the stuff. Um, but also I will just say, and because this will be published after this is released, um, we asked teens what their number one, um, most authentic video, you know, either social media or other media. And they all said Mr. Beast. Um, and Mr. Beast, yeah. do you know Mr. Beast? Yeah. Do you know who Mr. Beast is, Meg? So Mr. Yeah. Beast is a YouTube star and has some problematic things, you know, certainly in the past, but is also incredibly charitable and incredibly giving and is modeling a lot of the things that generosity and, you know, things like that. So curiosity, hope, curiosity yeah. um, for the generation this generation and what they're doing. And, and um, you know, you've got people like Gael out there and your son, Meg, and I'm sure your kids too, Megan. Um, so last but not least, before we end, let's each say, do you have one sort of recommendation for a storyteller to think about as they're thinking about how they might want to incorporate this these kind of virtues? And it could be any kind of story. It could be, you know, it could even be scientific storytelling. Um, you know, and certainly on social media. Let's start with Gael, then go to Meg, and then we'll end with Dr. Reen. So in particular, you're asking how you actually incorporate this into practical storytelling and these positive character values. Yeah. Any thoughts? <laughs> solve the problem. <laughs> right. Let me, let me solve the industry problem right now. So <laughs> I think for me, it's, it's understanding the complexity that young people have when it comes to one, their own, I guess, ideation towards happiness um, and to understand, first of all, what is the ultimate end goal in their why? And if that is happiness, if, if it's meaning and if those are separate from one another, um, because for me, and a thing that was interesting is um, again, we did another poll with an, with our audience, and not surprisingly, the majority weren't necessarily happy, but they also weren't sad. They weren't quite sure what they were feeling, um, and so I think it's interesting to frame these 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 virtues and these values as very complex and not exactly static. It's not a goal you reach and stay at forever. It's a, a, a something you touch. And ideally, a life with meaning and, and, a, and a story that is filled with hope is the pursuit of touching the certain emotion, the certain feeling over and over again, um, and touching it more often than you touch the opposite of it, the lows. Um, and so to me, I think it's, it's my recommendation is how do you showcase that it's not 
this everlasting happy ending, but it's a uh, it's 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 worth pursuing these temporary moments of happiness, um, even if they're not necessarily going to last forever. Meg, there's two Megs. <laughs> you Meg. I'm Meg. Meg again. <laughs> Uh, it's it's tricky as a storyteller because of course you I would never give advice to a storyteller what kind of story they can tell or you know that's it's such a personal artistic it is an art form at its best um, but what I, I I do find that when it is an art form and it's not about making a big buck and it literally is about the artistry of being honest mm -hmm. um, and it is about the artistry of facing things that are hard to face inside of yourself and getting very specific and. Uh, like we were talking about asking why and being honest. I just, it does start to shift into other things because that acceptance uh, starts to breed community. You know, I, I know that there's an entire group of social media that is all about perfection, but there is also community building around flaws and mistakes and that you're not alone. And I think the storytelling can really start to do that as the as the creators are honest about their own lives and what story they're telling and aware of what story they're telling aware of what messages they're putting out sometimes it can be as simple as that as somebody saying do you realize if you do that the message you're sending is this is that your intention mm -hmm. is your intention to tell young people um, that about suicide or whatever it could be right or where are the i think what you're doing is so amazing because just to come into consciousness but asking the questions about uh, your character's messaging without realizing you're messaging that I think can be very powerful experience and create a better story. Absolutely. Okay, I, Megan. All right. So, so I'll kind of say three things. So the first is um, many of you are probably aware, but the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy wrote a report last year about kind of youth mental health crisis. And one of the things he said in it is that our obligation to act is not just medical, it's moral. And so I think the first thing is just to think about incorporating these positive character, character virtues into the storytelling that is being done. So going off of what Megan yeah, um, Guile said, that to, to just make it a point because it can make such a difference. And it is almost a moral obligation that we have. We know that it changes um, outcomes um, in general and, and most likely does for mental health as well. Um, the, the second suggestion that I would make is to not be afraid to tell the stories of positive character virtues with folks confronting the very real problems that we have in this world today. And I think, you know, so many of the stories that are out there are fantasy, which has huge um, positive impact, but also situating some of these stories and the real challenges that the youth of today and the adults are facing could be influential. And then the third part, I'm going to put on my kind of intervention development hat here, which is to make sure that youth's voices, if you are aiming the storytellers at it, the stories at youth, are incorporated. Um, nobody wants to create a Barney version of a story for um, teens. You want it to be not just rooted in reality, but also resonant. And so making sure that you do get that feedback as you are creating the story um, could be just tremendously impactful. Those are all things we're doing at the center for sure. I know you are. Definitely trying to raise consciousness and have writers think about things. With and We are really trying to give them questions to ask rather than telling them and giving them research insights, bringing young people's voice into the storytelling process. Um, you know, uh, Meg's partner on her podcast, uh, it was brave enough to let some teens read her script and give her feedback. And I think she really appreciated that. So um, when you're young, writing for young people, as you can see, see from Gael, you know, there, there's so much they can offer. Um, and we all think, oh, our kids, we know young people, but you know, they're not representative of everyone. So thank you all. I'm really honored to have all of you on here. Um, you gave great, great, wonderful insights and, um, Hopefully we will live to see a better day and, and things will storytelling and the work that we're all doing will support, you know, youth and, and their mental health and building great, great, wonderful humans. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank me. It's nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you too.